geographers. I'm going to continue our geomorphology work last time. I was talking about some of the basics of geomorphology, but weathering and a little bit about mass wasting. Today, I'm going to get into some erosion, deposition stuff, but I'm not going to dwell too much on this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to get into some basics. I'm get my usual spiel on how this stuff works and deserts and, and all that, but we'll just do a greatest hits today. Uh, so I'm going to get into this concept of Eolian. I'll also at the end, I'll talk a little bit about fluvial processes as well, because these things can work hand in hand, so we'll connect some of that. But that's the idea here, and then I'll have another lecture after this one, which I get into glacial uh, landscapes and landforms and all of that. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the plan. Now, Eolian, which I think I, I may have mentioned this before to you, refers to any of this this geomorphology stuff, any denudation, right? So erosion, the transport of eroded materials, and then finally deposition of stuff. Um, it's any of that stuff, as long as it's connected to the wind. All right, so we're looking at how wind actually picks up, removes material, carries material, and sets it down someplace else. All right, and Eolius was one of the Greek wind gods. I think they had like, I don't know, more than like nine of them, something like that. It was all corresponding to the cardinal directions. Uh, but so Eolian processes are connected to Eolius, this Greek wind god. That's why you have that silent A there. You can also spell it with just the E. Uh, I think the A actually looks a little sexier, so that's why I stick with that. But it works either way. But again, it's simply referring to wind doing some kind of denudation. Now, erosion, this term I, I mentioned here, it's a, a key term, something we're going to be looking at for this lecture and the next one. We, we got into weathering before. That's just how stuff gets broken down, right? But it's not actually moving anything. Erosion is the moving. Right? It's picking stuff up, picking up weathered material, and taking it away. Okay, so we can define it as the wearing away of rock or soil by the action of wind, water, or ice. And okay, we'll primarily be looking at wind today, although we'll see a little bit about water as well today, as I said. And with the glacial stuff, we'll get into how ice does this. But specifically, with Eolian erosion, getting into exactly how wind picks up and removes material. And there's some mechanics of that that we'll get into, we'll spend time on. Um, but that's the first thing we're going to be covering. And with erosion, again, specifically Eolian erosion, but any kind of erosion, it's the removal of material. And therefore, we have specific landforms that are left behind. Okay, Something like this image we see here on the screen this is down in Bolivia. I mean, it's just... It's just fantastic. Anytime we see these weird, seemingly top-heavy rocks and, and things sticking up out of the ground, it just looks cool and, and crazy. But it's the result of erosion right here, where material is taken away. You don't see it piled up underneath. And you know this rock didn't just form in this way. So wind has gone in, picked up this material, taken it away. And it clearly, it's there's more erosion taking place at the base of this rock than up at the top, all right? Hence the cool look. But so when we're going through, we'll get into how erosion works in an Eolian sense, but we're also going to look at specific landforms. The things, what things are left behind out on the landscape that are the result of Eolian processes. And then after we get into that, we'll also spend some time looking at this, the depositional landforms, where all of the material that's been picked up, anything that's been eroded, it's going to be carried elsewhere, and a lot of that material will eventually get piled up and make its own landform, which is what a sand dune is. We'll spend some time talking about dunes and how they work, but those are also very distinct landforms, 
So we want to understand the mechanics of how the stuff moves, but we also want to get into how do these things form. So as I go through, and this is, you know, for studying and all that, just think about what's an erosional landform, what's a depositional landform, as well as, you know, what kind, what produced this thing. Was it wind, flowing water, glacial movement, you know, that kind of stuff. So we'll be covering that as we go through here. Now, with Aeolian processes, the vast majority of what we know comes from this guy, Ralph Bagnold, who I just think is, I basically, I, I nerd out over guys like this because it's a great blend of, uh, you know, like science and discovery and all that, and machine guns uh, and trucks uh, and, you know, those things because I'm, I'm a five-year-old boy uh, at heart, right? But Bagnold, super cool. Uh, you can see him in the upper right, beginning of his career and toward the end. He was a British Army guy uh, stationed in northern Africa, okay, in the Sahara station in Egypt and went into Libya and, and just explored the desert as, you know, British Army guys would do at the time. And he's there in between the two world wars, okay? Uh, and so as he's there, he's driving around and exploring and and. He and this group, the Long Range, the Desert Group, I think, I forget, because I'm not a like, military history nerd, um, but there are plenty of those folks out who have made websites on uh, this group. Uh, they're just, you know, out learning how to do army guy stuff out in the desert, how to drive in the sand, which you know, we tried to do it. It's not as easy uh, as it might seem. You see the little skin things that they have laid out in front of the truck to be able to give it traction so it can get through this loose material, right? So there's a lot of that going on, which is quite useful. Uh, and, you know, when World War II happens and you've got Nazis running around Northern Africa, Rommel, the Desert Fox, a lot of you know, the ability for allied forces to succeed in defeating the Nazis there, it comes from folks like this who are learning just how deserts work. Right? And I think it's always, you know, important to just recap. Like, you guys remember? I talked to you guys about uh, Osama bin Laden, right? That was geographers who actually found him. Yeah, and then, and here, you know, geographers also uh, helped defeat Hitler. Look, the point is, you're welcome, right? I don't, I don't like to dwell on this stuff or make it embarrassing or whatever, but just anytime there's some kind of supervillain who exists out in the world, if you really look at it, ultimately, it's geographers who are defeating them. And, and don't worry, we're, we're getting to the bottom of the coronavirus uh, as well, I'm sure. I mean, I'm not doing it. I'm just talking to you guys. But there are others, you know, my homies, um, so I'll take credit for that as well. All right, so there's that. But then, after Bagnell retires, he goes back home to England, and instead of, you know, like playing golf or whatever, he builds a wind tunnel in his garage. Right? He just, he had so much fun learning about sand and deserts and stuff like that in northern uh, Africa. When he comes home, he tries to recreate this stuff and tries to figure out how do sand dunes form and move and, and all of that. So he writes this book, The Physics of Blown Sand and Desert Dunes, which is, you know, it's telling you exactly what the book is all about um, right there. But it's back in 1941 when this thing is published, and it's still held as a, you know, a great text. Like nobody's, a lot of, you know, other scientific stuff, you don't necessarily go back and read the thing that's, you know, decades old. You're looking at more recent stuff. But this is real. this is just a solid work on understanding a lot of this Aeolian stuff operates. So it's still held as a, a classic text. Um, uh, the way the story goes is when NASA, when the folks there set their sights on sending these rover things to Mars, they bought a bunch of copies of Bagnold's book because it's just, it's still, it's such a useful thing and it would help them understand what was happening on the Martian surface, All right? So a pretty cool guy. And honestly, like, as we'll see, in fact, I'll go to this next one uh, here. Um, you know, a lot of what we know, again, comes directly from his work. So this I just scanned from the book. Uh, but it's a, a 
graph showing just how much sand can be eroded by wind. Right? And wind is one of those things when it comes to denudation. Globally, it maybe isn't the most powerful force that would go to um, fluvial processes, rivers and streams, which are pretty remarkable. I mean, I talked about when I was getting into water initially, you know, weeks, months ago, whenever it was, uh, how, you know, how little rivers make up in terms of all the water on the uh, surface of the earth, right? Most of that stuff is out in the oceans. Rivers are this teeny tiny, I forget what it was, like 0.003% of the, the surface water that we have, right? Or even all the water that we have or whatever. So they're a tiny component, but that said, rivers are still unbelievably powerful in what they're able to do, what they're able to carve out and deposit and so on. So those are the, globally speaking, rivers are the, the big force. When it comes to Aeolian forces, when it comes to wind, globally, maybe not so impressive, but in local instances, it can be quite powerful. So where conditions are right, Aeolian forces can be the most dominant thing uh, at work. Right? And we tend to see in deserts, this is where it really picks up, uh, because vegetation, when you have plants in the ground, that limits what wind can do. So in areas where you've got, you know, healthy forests and plenty of plants and all that, Aeolian processes, even if winds are coming through, it's not going to be that impressive. But when you're in a desert where you don't have any vegetation, then wind can be quite powerful. And what Bagnold is showing here with this, uh, if we look at, let me get my little, little laser pointer here. Um, so on this side, we've got sand movement in metric tons per hour, and it's like within a cross-section of a dune. So here we have, you know, moving one ton of sand per hour. A wind velocity down here, it's in meters per second. But honestly, this corresponds to roughly about, oh yeah, I put it up here so we didn't have to be all European. So 60 meters per second, it's about 35 miles per hour is what we're dealing with. Right? My Antelope Valley is. Is a 35 mile per hour wind, is that, is that shocking to you? Is that something that, uh, you know, you can't even fathom? No. Uh, I think that's supposed to happen like later today. I mean, that's just, that's just normal, right? That's a normal fact of life here in the Mojave Desert. We're used to these things, especially in the spring. Like now is the time when we just, we deal with winds like crazy. Um, so honestly, in an hour, 35 miles per hour, really easy to envision a ton of sand getting moved every hour as that's going on, right? That's, a, it's, that's happening all the time in a place like the Antelope Valley, in a place like the Mojave Desert. If I were teaching this to other students in some other part of California or the world even, uh, I would say something like 35 mile per hour winds. And the students there would say, what? Is that even possible? Isn't that called a tornado or hurricane? And I would say, no, there are certain parts of this state uh, where that's normal. And, and they would say, yes, but clearly no one could live there. And I would say, no, there are people. I've met them. Um, and they, they seem okay with it. All right? Um, yeah, we put up with it. Um, but yeah, this isn't normal for every other person part of the state. We don't see this uh, these winds quite as much, but that's why Aeolian processes are a big deal in a place like this, but maybe not so much in the rest of California and other parts of the country or the world or whatever. Okay, So as this wind is blown along, if it's moving fast enough, it's picking up a lot of material. Okay? Now, as it comes through and is picking up stuff, we're going to have this process called deflation taking place, which is where just loose, weathered material that's on the ground is going to get picked up and carried away, okay? taken elsewhere. Again, this is erosion, right? The wearing down of, of rock or soil, just land in general. This stuff gets picked up and carried away. We're having erosion take place, 
and deflation is the exact term we're using for this type of erosion. Okay, so deflation in the Aeolian sense is a, a form, a specific form of erosion. And what will happen when this takes place, when deflation is occurring, is we get a very specific erosional landform, which we call a desert pavement. Okay? Meaning it looks it's supposed to look kind of like a cobblestone street. Okay? Not like pavement like we think of like asphalt where it's one continuous smooth thing, but think more like you know old timey places where you have cobblestones in the road. That's what it looks like. Because all that's left behind are these larger rocks, right? These larger stones that the wind can't actually pick up. So the idea is you can also see here I like this image because it shows the idea of deflation. Right? We think of something deflating like a balloon or whatever. It's getting smaller, right? So this shows it. Let me pull up my laser pointer here. We've got this, this little cross section of desert land. You've got a mix of small particles of sand. You've got um, the bigger rocks themselves. So as the wind's coming through, it's only able to pick up the little stuff right here, right? And it continues to blow that away. It's removing it. And then, sorry, I've got a garbage truck driving by. So if you a little, just think of that as wind coming through and picking up stuff. Um, so the wind keeps coming through. It keeps removing the little stuff. That causes the, the ground to actually shrink down, right? Think of that as the deflation. But all that's left behind are these larger rocks and that just continues and continues until you get to the point where there's really nothing left behind in terms of little tiny particles of sand and what we do have left behind are just these rocks so we get this again this desert pavement so throughout the mojave you can you know head out uh into the desert and find some key places where it's just this is what you have all over. You don't see, you know, sand and sand dunes and things like that because of deflation, because of erosion, right? What you instead see are these very densely packed rocks, this desert pavement piled in here, all right? Now, of that, those little uh, bits of sand, the grains, those things that are being eroded, those are going to be picked up and carried away. And as they're being carried away, we have another type of erosion taking place. This time we're dealing with Eolian abrasion, okay? And this is where, it's the idea of, of sandblasting. If you've seen that or done that, uh, it's this, you know, industrial process where you shoot part of little grains of sand at something, like strip paint off of it, right? It's like hardcore sandpaper, okay? Um, so that's, that's what nature's doing. That's what Eolian abrasion is. It's all that sand that's been picked up it's being carried along, and as it's being carried along, it's blasting against something, right? It's, it's sandblasting a rock, right, or a bunch of rocks or whatever that are just out there naturally. And as it does this, depending on the you know, wind speed and particle size and all this stuff, it can polish the existing rocks and the big landforms that are out there. Um, so it smooths it out, right, if you have very fine-grained sand, or it can pit the rock, meaning it's putting in big holes uh, in the thing because it's larger grains of sand, so it's like coarser sandpaper, things like that. Or you can get some areas where you get these grooves, this fluting that takes place, where you have cool grooves running through the rock that's simply the result of this Eolian abrasion. All right, so you see this, and you, you, know, you see this too in the Mojave Desert. In fact, these two pictures here, I took not too far from each other. Um, so you have one area where you have this desert pavement taking place, and not too far from there, you've got these pinnacles sticking up, this rock that's sticking up, and it's just undergoing all of this abrasion. It's wearing down. And I know that Aeolian abrasion is at work here, because what you can't tell from this photo is I also was getting sandblasted. Oh, it's a miserable day. Wind like crazy. Big hunks of sand just like smashing against your face. You guys, you, you probably experienced this, right? You were like walking to your car past an empty lot, um, you know, just in town here, and you'll get blasted with sand on one of these windy days. 
that's eolian abrasion. That's what we're dealing with. Okay? Now, as this is working, this eolian abrasion is taking place, what we get are what we call ventifax, which is just a fun, silly little name, referring to, you know, it's artifacts from the wind, from this eolian abrasion. All right, so they're shaped aerodynamically, technically, with that direction of the wind. So like we see this one right here, click my laser pointer, um, we see this specific rock, it didn't start out looking that way, right? It's a ventifax because it has been shaped just progressively as wind is blowing, as this abrasion is taking place. It's shaping this rock and it has kind of this like arrow shape to it because the wind is clearly, it's coming along from like this direction right here, right? So it's blowing over here and it keeps carving this thing in this way. So we can see that where clearly the wind is not only you know, working on this stuff, but it's leaving behind clues in terms of its direction, how it's, you know, changed over the years, what's going on. Here's a, a picture uh, from the, the Greater Antelope Valley, and we've got a few things going on. So if we're looking at this first, we're going to think about, okay, what happened to break this rock apart? All right, like we could have jointing. We talked about that where we have these natural fractures in there. But this thing seems really wedged apart there. So what do you think would have done that? I'll pause. I'll wait for your little hands to go up in the air. I don't know, at home, in your bedroom or office or whatever. Yes, you? Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah, it's that frost action. That's, um, right, you guys remember? Uh, it's where water gets in, freezes. The, the actual freezing part expands the water, the ice is expanding, taking up more space, so it keeps pushing apart, right? Or wedging down, splitting this thing. So we have that physical weathering taking place, but then as a result, as this thing has split apart, you also have this ventifact thing going on. You've got Aeolian abrasion. And again, this is another thing where there's, you know, constantly winds blowing up here, little bits of sand blowing around, uh, and it's shaping this thing. I couldn't quite get the photo to, to fully show it, but it's like this fin of rock just sticking up right there. It just continues to get smaller and smaller as more grains of sand carve this thing down, right? Or sanding it down. Okay, so that's what a ventifact is. And then just a big ventifact, we call that a yarding. I don't know why. It's kind of ridiculous. I do know, though, that here in the Antelope Valley, we have some of the best yardangs ever. Um, they're out like on Edwards Air Force Bay. This is what we're looking at right here, where it's just these big ridges of rock. So it's just a, a yardang. It's just a big ventifact. All right? That's the, the idea. And you can envision that, yes, we here in the AV would have some great ones. I mean, you have people coming from all over the world to see our beautiful yardangs. Um, of course we have them because we got wind. We have crazy wind, like conditions are just perfect for this uh, kind of stuff. So yeah, we got we got us some nice yardings. So that's you know put that again in the uh, the wind column of stuff we got. All right, so that so material has been picked up. It's being carried along. It's it's either eroding there right from the source, or it's doing this abrasion to continue the eroding as it's being carried away. But then, all of that material eventually has to be set down somewhere, right? It's got to be deposited. Eventually, the winds die down and the stuff gets dropped down to the ground. So we have three different types of depositional Aeolian landforms that we'll be looking at here. The first one, ripples, they're pretty straightforward. And then we'll get into dunes. We'll look at how sand dunes form and operate. And then we'll get into uh, what are called Luss Hills. And it's pronounced Luss. It's like a German word. Because um, this is where this stuff studied. So we'll get into that, which is a little different from the first two. But it's still that same idea of material getting picked up by the wind and being carried elsewhere. Okay? So let's get into this. So ripples. Yep. Right? You see it? Um, 
Yeah, there you go. So it's when we have sand, and you can see this all over, uh, you know, the Antelope Valley, um, which is where, again, a lot of these photos, I haven't had to travel too far to get some of this great stuff to take uh, pictures here. It's either here in the Antelope Valley or out in the Panamint Valley or again, some of the surrounding areas, Death Valley itself, um, you know, going into there. We've got a lot of this just kind of classic Eolian uh, landform stuff it's a it's a great place to study it uh which is what i've been doing since i came down here and and you know shed a little tear when i realized okay i'm gonna be in the desert for a while um you know i decided you know who needs trees right <laughs> who needs green and happiness um no and so I, i've been trying to study the desert more and we'll continue we're not going to dwell on it too much here because i want to get through this stuff so you guys have material for your exam but when we get into the final section we get into biomes i'll spend some time talking about deserts and specifically the mojave desert and we'll connect some of the stuff and get into you know what i've discovered throughout of researching you know reading through books or just cruising around here what's kind of cool about the place but this is something you can just see everywhere um wherever we have sand that's been deposited you can see it on the side of the road in some areas or out at this i think is at saddleback butte state park not too far from uh, lancaster and, and palmdale itself out here in lake la we've got these ripples and it's simply the the sand is deposited but continuing winds will pick this stuff up and set it down and we've got it's called saltation which is a little hopping uh, sand grains and all that kind of gets built up in this way that looks like ripples or you know small little waves in a pond okay so when we see that that's that's the wind continuing to push this stuff but also depositing it in some area so the sand didn't start here it came from elsewhere and was picked up and we had deflation and abrasion and all that happening and it eventually gets set down right there now sand dunes are like big ripples and i put this picture this was from a book that we used to use and i just loved it and even i think when they switched from one edition to the next edition of the book they got rid of this picture and i get it it's not the most flattering view of this young woman um right here but i like the photo not for creepy reasons but because it just shows the fantasticness of sand dunes how they're just oh they're great like if you ever want to hear me giggle um take me to a sand dune you can't help it. You, 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 gotta, you just got to squeal um, with delight. And that's whether, you know, you're driving dirt bikes or whatever up and down these things. Or, it's even easier, it's just hike to the top and sled down the thing. Oh, fantastic. They're just fun. Um, and so that's why I put this, you know, keep this one in here, even though it's unfortunate. And what I feel, too, is that the idea of playing on sand dunes, it's one of those things we can do out in nature where, you know, as long as we're not being totally irresponsible, it's not, it's like the worst thing you can do to these, you know, natural landscapes. And it's an idea like we have, well, it's, some of this is just probably social issues, but we tend to allow stuff to happen to sand dunes uh, in ways that we wouldn't necessarily allow in other places, like the idea of driving dirt bikes and jeeps and stuff all over these things that's seen as okay um now we don't do that at dunes near you know in coastal locations we do it more in the dunes that are out deeper in the desert and that frankly is because you've got million dollar real estate out by the coast and and you know we consider it to be wasteland um out in the desert right so you don't see this you see signs that say like keep off the dunes if you're near the beach itself that's really for the the property owners but out in the desert you can play on a lot of this stuff and really the reason for that is because sand dunes are a constantly changing thing they're not some permanent landform and while we'll have creatures that are living out in the desert because sand dunes are such a dynamic thing it's not like you know a delicate habitat if you want to think of it that way so with sand dunes what happens typically when we see them is they're asymmetrical meaning that they don't they're not perfectly even on either side you're going to have one side that has a longer but gentler slope and then another side that has a shorter but steeper slope 
right? And this longer side is what we call the windward side, meaning it's the side that's directly facing the wind, right? So we see this blue arrow here, the wind is coming from this direction and it's hitting, it's meeting that windward side, which again is longer but a gentler slope. And then what happens is as it's blowing along, it, we've got little grains of sand that are getting pushed up. So a lot of this stuff, it's been deposited from elsewhere. So we have a lot of sand in this area, but the wind continues to push it. So it's not getting you know, picked up and carried for miles, but it's getting bounced. So again, this idea of saltation is bouncing um, you know, bits of sand. It's bouncing up this sand dune and working its way up here to the very top. Okay, now this other side, we call the leeward side. So it's just the side opposite of that prevailing wind direction. And it's gonna have that much steeper slope. And what happens, and it's all because of, again, the wind, which side is facing the wind, which one isn't. But what happens is, just normally, that uh, um, leeward side is gonna hang out around what we call the angle of repose. And I mentioned that last time. The angle of repose, I'm sure you all perfectly remember, is just that angle at which a slope remains stable, right? And for sand, it's roughly, it's anywhere between 30 to about 35 degrees, depending on grain size and all that, right? So as long as that leeward side is under roughly 35 degrees, it's going to be stable and everything will be cool. But what happens is, all this sand that gets pushed up and bounced up this way, it piles up and will actually make this steeper right here. And so the leeward side, what we also call the slip face, uh, <clears throat> because of what's going to happen, as it goes past that angle of repose, so let's say it you know, builds up to 36, 37 degrees or whatever, it's going to be unstable and we'll have a little sand slide take place. All right, so this slides down. And what actually happens is that as long as winds are blowing, you're going to have sand um, coming from this windward side, moving over here, and then sliding down and adding to the leeward side. And we can actually see over time, sand dunes will move. All right, they don't stay in one place. And of course, it depends on the rate uh, of you know, just how much wind is in an area how often it's blowing, how powerful it is, and all that, that will determine how often these things move. And it's not like you can go out into the desert and you can just watch sand dunes, like, you know, cruising around or whatever. But it does, over time, change, right? And even if it's not moving some vast, you know, distance, as winds pick up, like as you're sliding down and, and having fun on the sand dunes, um, you know, as it... Uh, um, uh, continues to uh, blow and all that, your tracks will be covered up, right? Because little saltating grains of sand will, will come in here and, and cover this stuff. So sand dunes are quite uh, uh, dynamic things, meaning that they're changing, right? Constantly moving and changing and transforming. And that's, that's just one of the cool things about them. And this is something that, you know, Bagnold was trying to get at with his whole wind tunnel, stuff was just to see, you know, not just the erosion, but like what happens with this sand. This is what's going on, okay? So they're dynamic things. And we have, as of this, we have some different types of dunes, and we're not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, um, I'm not going to get too nerdy about this, but I'm just going to point out some of these. Um, we'll have just quite simply, we have what are called transverse dunes, which is referring to these where the wind direction, it's perpendicular with the dunes themselves. So this kind of looks like the ripple thing that we saw, where it's just these lines, like waves coming. You can kind of see it from here, right? Like we've got the ocean, got the coastline right there. Wind is actually causing these waves. So we're not going to dwell on, but you can read that chapter of the book and get into how that works. Uh, but as that wind continues on, it's going to be pushing up these dunes, transporting the stuff, depositing them in these specific transverse dune shapes. All right? And we get these when we have a huge amount of sand, really no vegetation, 
as we're seeing here, and as long as the wind is steadily coming from the same direction, um, you know, over time it's going to build up these just long waves that we call transverse dunes. All right? Now another one, and these are cool, we have these in California, these are called Barkin dunes, and this, we quite often, we see these at the edge of, uh, like you leave the transverse dunes, you don't have quite the same amount of uh, sand piled up because you're getting further and further from that. And then these, what were those transverse dunes, they kind of curve around and they make this crescent shape. And what's cool, you can still see the windward side and the leeward side, right? And looking at this one, so the longer, the gentler slope right here, that's got to be the windward side. And then it's much steeper on the inside here, that's our leeward side or slip face. And so these will move. That's a classic geography. I don't know if you've taken a lab class, you might see something like this, um, or you look online or whatever. But they're like satellite photos, or, or yeah, I think I guess the aerial photos from a while ago. That's what I did this stuff on. You know, when I was learning some of it. <clears throat> but it's you look at different over the years, different uh, uh, images of these bark and dunes and. Southern California, wherever it exactly was, uh, and you can see that they are moving position, right? Over time, I forget what the actual interval was, but they're moving, and again, it's because of that whole, you know, windward, leeward thing, and the slip face continuing to have stuff fall down, and, and stuff is getting pushed up here, and they'll continue to move. So you still see very little vegetation, but they just the amount of just piles of sand, a little less, but still the same idea that we have that prevailing wind direction, right? And then this final one I'll show, these are called star dunes, and these are really cool. They, these get really big, and it's because they don't actually have a true windward side, leeward side, because they form where you have multiple winds coming from you, know, multiple directions, so they get pushed up. And so they're relatively stable in the sense that they're not changing position. They will have, you know, they continue to get built up. So that's why you you know you can see stuff that just looks smooth and nice. Um, in here it's because as winds come in, they're going to keep pushing sand grains up, right? And it might slide down on this side, but then you'll have another wind coming in over here and it'll push stuff up and then it'll slide down on this side and so on. And so these star, star dunes, again, we're looking at stuff where we've got very little vegetation. It's very dry desert environments. But in this case, we have multiple winds coming from different directions, and it pushes these things up. Is that, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah? All right. Now, this final type of depositional uh, stuff, landforms, what we call lust deposits. And so this is where we're not actually dealing with sand. We're dealing with dust, okay? Fine grain, silt, and clay. I don't know if I've gone into detail with this. I, I really try not to talk too much about grain size because it's maybe the most boring thing uh, in this entire class. I mean, that's, you know, some of you are thinking about sand something. Um, but it's simply sand. We know what sand is. Silt is just smaller grains. Um, you know, so it's the same material. It's that weathered material. It's rock mineral stuff right? Quartz and feldspar and stuff like that, uh, you know, in the continents. Um, so we've got sand. You make that sand a little bit smaller, we call it silt. You make that silt a little bit smaller, you make it clay. All right, so dealing with the silt and clay, it's the same concept. It's this heavily weathered material, but it's just, it's more fine grain. That's what dust is, or what we tend to think of just as being dirt, right? So that's what we're dealing with here. That's what these lust deposits are made up of. What actually happened was we had glaciers coming through North America, uh, and we'll get into glacial activity, and we're not going to dwell on the Ice Age that much when we get into it, but we've all heard about the Ice Age, the, the last great Ice Age that we had, where we had a lot of North America covered by these continental glaciers, um, you know, compared to what we see today, most definitely, and it's slowly retreating temperatures or you know climates are changing and, and all of that so the ice goes away 
that these massive glaciers have just eroded the hell out of North America. Okay? And so what they leave behind, once that ice is gone, is we've got a bunch of dust where just the continent has been pulverized up there at the surface. So we've got a lot of this dust just lying around. It dries out. Uh, we don't have plants, you know, growing right away. It would have been a very, you know, kind of barren uh, area as those glaciers are first going away. And so then winds come in and pick up the silt and the clay, blow it around, again, Aeolian transport, and then eventually gets deposited, right? And so they pile up. They're not sand dunes in the sense that it's not sand, but it kind of makes the same general idea. <clears throat> where we have, uh, um, you know, this material has been carried by the wind, piled up, makes these, you know, hills in an area, and then eventually, you know, as this stuff gets piled up, it stops moving as plants return, vegetation grows. And you can see in this area here, um, we've got, you know, the bulldozer going through, clearing out, cutting into the hill itself. It just, it's just dust, right? Like it looks like flour. Um, in there. You don't see a lot of rock or anything else in there. It's just all kind of homogenous running throughout. That's what we're dealing with. And this is all over the Midwest. And when you, if you go through here, you'll see hills that exist. And, you know, they got into the tectonic activity, the folding, and, you know, ideas like that, why we have the Appalachians, why we have the Rockies, and, you know, how these different things form from tectonic activity. You might think that's what you're dealing with here. It's not. It's just dust that got piled up. And the vegetation, the plant life and all that, grew on top of it. Um, and, but, you know, so it looks kind of normal in the sense of, you know, how other hills and mountains and stuff like that form through tectonic activity. But it's just dust that's piled up. And so this is what, you know, something would look like today. Uh, in here, this is out in Iowa. Uh, and if you go back, you know, to going back to that whole physiographic divisions, that map that I show with the, the geomorphology, the different regions around the country, again, we're dealing with um, the interior plains, right? So we have the Midwest. We tend to think of it as a flat area, but you've got these spots where you've got hills, but they're the Lus Hills. They're deposits from Aeolian transport. All right, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so that's the depositional stuff. Um, and so in deserts, we've got, you know, wind is a powerful force because we have very little vegetation. We have, you know, especially here, the Mojave Desert with the, the you know, Sierra Nevada and the other mountains that we have, just conditions are right to where we have winds blowing constantly in the area so clearly eolian processes are at work and they've they've altered a place like the mojave quite heavily what we don't always realize though is that fluvial processes so those done by flowing water by rivers streams creeks things like that those have also shaped deserts quite dramatically okay right? so even in a place like death valley uh, where we think, you know, the driest, hottest, most miserable place in the world, uh, still water plays a role in shaping it and making it look the way it does. So I just want to briefly talk about fluvial processes. And again, that's simply referring to the same stuff, erosion, transportation, deposition of material. But we're now not talking about wind. We're getting into how, into how flowing water picks this stuff up carries it along so it's eroding right removing stuff which is what this canyon here would be that's a uh, uh, an erosional landform and that's kind of a weird thing to think about bring this up do some real teaching um but it's the idea that all of this would have been you know land the the ground right up top right here before this fluvial erosion took place right so all of that was just normal ground level. But as this river moved through here, it cut down, right? It eroded. And so what it left behind is actually an absence of material, right? That's kind of the crazy thing when you're trying to think of 
Is this an erosional or depositional landform? Is stuff still there or did it get eroded, you know, in the sense that we're missing something, right? That was there thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, whatever the timeline might be. So a canyon or a valley or a ravine, like we have these different types of, uh, you know, voids um, in here. It's all kind of like a dirty nuance in there, but the same idea, right? Valley, canyon, whatever. For us, it's going to be the same thing. This is an erosional landform in that something isn't there, but it used to be there. So the water picked up the rock, the weathered rock, all the material in there, carried it along, took it elsewhere, right? That's the idea. So that's what we're talking about when we get into fluvial processes. Okay? Another term, alluvium, right up here, um, refers to any of that material that's been picked up, so sand or silt or clay or rocks themselves or whatever, um, that have been picked up by some fluvial process, by flowing water, and then deposited. Okay, so if it's just, you know, something we call gravel or sand or whatever, just normally, if a river picks it up from one area, carries it along, and then dumps it someplace else, the technical term for that is alluvium all right and this just goes back to what i was talking about last time like i know you might think like god there's a name for everything just commit that to memory right just jot this stuff down in your notes it's helpful because when you see this word alluvium in as we'll see in names of things you know it has to be the result of fluvial processes right and it has to be depositional because that's what alluvium is right so these terms as obnoxious as they can be, they can actually be quite useful in figuring this stuff out. So alluvium, you know, like in this sense, all the rocks that we see, the bigger stuff and the smaller pebbles and, and even, you know, silt and stuff that would be in here, where it's been left behind by the river, we're not going to get into the dynamics of how these things operate, like how rivers, you know, are a lot or a little or how speed and volume and all that stuff plays a role. But it's the idea, as this water is coming along, at a certain point, it deposits this material that came from upstream. It was eroded someplace else. It was carried by the river. Eventually, it gets set down right where it is, right? And therefore, we call it alluvium. All right, now, here we go. Here's that payoff, right? In the desert, it might not necessarily be clear uh, because, we, you know, we don't often see rivers running through them, and we've got some of them. The Colorado is the biggest, kind of, you know, somewhat permanent example that we have relatively close by. Um, so that's, you know, a river we can see. But there are other spots, plenty of other spots, out in the Mojave Desert where, you know, water has flown through at a certain point. It's just not visible right now, you know, because it's a desert, right? But we can see what we call alluvial fans, which are quite a uh, useful landform from a human standpoint, and they're just kind of cool to see. And it's, a, you know, for nothing else, they're clues that water does go through an area. But this is where we have some kind of canyon entering a valley. Okay? So if you've been to, and I don't have, because I'm kind of just kind of shrinking the stuff to make it to the point, I don't have images of Death Valley in here, but it's the idea, well, you can Google it if you haven't been. If you haven't been there, first off, shame on you. Get out there. Um, I mean, not now, because you can't, because it's shut down. But you got to check it out. It's, it's cool. But when you go in there, right, it's a valley, meaning you're in the low spot here. And you've got mountain ranges on either side, right, either side of the valley. So you're contained, right? which is also why it's so hot in there, because it's just like this oven where it heats up and you don't have, you know, breezes coming in and blowing air out and all the circulation. It just kind of cooks you down in there. That's why it's so hot in this area. But so when it rains, which it does, rarely, but it does happen, uh, this water will fall into the, the mountains themselves. It'll channel down into these little valleys and canyons and stuff and start flowing down. And it's flowing down quickly because these are steep mountains on either side. 
And so as this stuff is flowing down and the water's moving fast, it's eroding, okay? It's quickly eroding material. And so it's carrying along all of this gravel and sand and silt and clay. All this material is being carried along in these fast-moving streams that are formed in the canyon, okay? Then once it hits the valley floor, that water is no longer confined, okay? So it's not in this little channel. And it also, the slope isn't the same. It's entering this flat area. So the water slows down immediately. Okay, and what happens is when you have flowing water, so it's going fast, it's eroding stuff quite quickly, and then as it slows down, it's got all this stuff that it's eroded, but it can't carry as much. So we call it exceeds capacity to carry all of this material. So it has to quickly dump, deposit all of that eroded material, right? It dumps out that alluvium. So this is what happens as you get to the base of one of these canyons and you get to the valley floor, you have all this alluvium that pops up and it kind of, it fans out. It makes like a kind of triangular conical shape. I'll have some pictures here in a moment, um, but it, it has this distinct look to it. And so the fan idea is like it fans out onto the valley floor and it just leaves all of this, this sediment there. And this term bahada refers to when you have multiple overlapping alluvial things, like this just this slope that's clearly just alluvium that's been deposited in an area um, just you know over and over, and it's all there's a lot of it, so it is overlapping. You can't see the distinct fans. Right, so here's an image showing the general idea. These would be the fans right here. So if we look at them from above, in fact, I think I have a better image here. Yeah, it would be, you know, it's kind of, it's hard to describe. Like, you know, in a test question or whatever. I'm not going to say fan-shaped. You know, a little hint because that would give it away. Um, but it's kind of, like I said, triangular or conical if you're facing it from the ground. Is what we're seeing right here. Um, so it's all this stuff comes down. From the canyons, as soon as it starts to hit that valley floor, it immediately starts slowing. It deposits the alluvium. And what happens, this is actually a pretty cool thing, pretty useful for people out in the desert. The, the mountains themselves, where this stuff starts, it's bedrock, right? It's impermeable granite or whatever is out there, okay? So the water just has to flow down there. And then as it hits the valley floor, there's a certain order to which these the flowing water will get rid of material. Okay, It gets rid of, as it's struggling to carry all this stuff along, it's going to get rid of the heaviest stuff first. So initially, you're going to have boulders, cobbles, gravel, just the big rocks themselves are going to be left at the base of the canyon, and the water's going to continue. And it gets rid of all that, and it continues to slow, so then it's going to get rid of you know more of the, the smaller bits of sand, then it'll get rid of the silt, then it'll get rid of the clay. Okay, so it's all it's sorted as this stuff is getting deposited. And so what that does is you've got the impermeable bedrock right here. Clay kind of does the same thing because the stuff is so small in terms of the particles themselves. It may, it's hard for water to pass through clay that gets packed together. Right. So as this water is you know, flowing down, it's going to flow down into the valley, but some of that water is going to seep down into the loose gravel and sand. And so we get an aquifer that forms in this area, you know, groundwater, right? So in an incredibly dry desert, you're going to have water, water resources, and it's protected underneath the ground, so it doesn't immediately, you know, evaporate and disappear. And so we have all sorts of places. Like I think San Bernardino is an example of it. It exists. It was able to exist precisely because of an alluvial fan. Because there was this aquifer out in the desert. The you know original folks who went out there were able to sink wells and you know, bring up water to drink and irrigate crops and, and that kind of stuff. Death Valley itself is amazing in that you know hottest, driest place in the world, and yet there are fish that live underneath it, effectively, in these little caverns and, and stuff. So that's cool. Um, 
it's also, I mean, there's crazy stuff too. I was out there not too long ago, uh, and, and had a guy, he showed me, um, a koi pond, uh, that exists. And it's not, it's not like a natural koi pond, but it's in the middle of this horrendously hot, dry area. But it's this kind of stuff. It's the groundwater that exists. And it's a place where people lived out there years and years ago. Had this little pond area just naturally being filled with, uh, uh, you know, groundwater itself. But somebody put some koi fish in there. And they're doing great. They, you know, swam up to us and, and it's in the dead. Like, it just doesn't even make sense, right? It's hard to compute, but it's because of this kind of stuff. Right? And there are other examples of how, how uh, water can shape deserts. We're not going to dwell on it too much. I just want to introduce you to some of this. But I will end this with, you know, how this is not just, you know, kind of cool from a, an earthly standpoint. We can actually see examples of this stuff elsewhere, right? Mars clearly had water flowing at some point in time. And we know this because of stuff like alluvium that exists there today, right? And so this is another example of deserts and rivers and stuff working together. But we've had, as I said, you know, NASA started sending these rovers and things out to Mars, taking pictures of just the surface itself, uh, up close and from afar, and we've seen, frankly, we've seen some rather disappointing stuff. And I say disappointing in the fact that, I mean, come on, right? What does that look like? That's like Rosamond, right? I mean, that doesn't even, I don't even, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we found out. I mean, we got NASA folks out at Edwards uh, Air Force Base. I would not be surprised if they were getting desperate for results, and they just stepped outside and took a picture of, like, you know, one of the parking lots. It was a little banged up uh, near the NASA offices there. <laughs> this doesn't look too far removed from the greater Antelope Valley, from the Mojave Desert itself. But, you know, because we trust our government implicitly, we're going to just assume they're telling the truth uh, with this. But yeah, this is on Mars. And it's it's disappointing in that it looks so Earth-like. Right? But then you think about it, I mean, you know, we talked about the whole planetesimal theory and the idea that we have a nebula and things collide and our planets form. And we talked about, you know, a long time ago, how meteor, um, meteorites will fall to the uh, surface and we'll look at those. And we're not finding these crazy alien elements and things like that because it's all the same stuff, right? The laws of nature that work here make sense that they would be working on a place like Mars as well. Right, so rather normal looking, and they even the then when I was you know first pulled these and reading it, the reason they circled this one was they were just showing you know that rounded shape when you pick up rocks when you're picking up alluvium from a stream bed or whatever they have that rounded shape to them as they just kind of keep getting tumbled along going downstream. They're pointing out like we're seeing that right. This clearly was water flowing along. It was eroding from some other place depositing here. And then this too, that we have the loose alluvium, but this would be conglomerate, which is a clastic sedimentary rock. Okay, so it's just what we found as you know as we explore more and more, it's just how how close some of these other places in the solar system are to what we have here. Because it's all the same rocks. Um same here's another picture again. Very Rosamondi, Mojave y looking. Um but, you know, whatever. Uh, and they even, and this was kind of unfortunate because it's so drawn on and, and colored. But this what they found here, and it's kind of hard to see with the shading and all that. Um, but it's a it's an alluvial fan, right? So an example of, you can see the, the little canyon right here. Stuff eroded from up here, comes down into the valley, gets deposited. And the, the colors, it's showing what we call hypsometric tinting. We use different colors to show different elevations and so the blue here is that lowest elevation and so it's kind of like death valley effectively is what we're looking at right and so the reddish areas here are where the mountains are going up that's what we're seeing yeah so yeah there you go there's your fun space news uh connecting all of this but hopefully this stuff makes sense to you just gonna go back through it read through the book Get a sense of what does eolium mean? How does stuff get eroded? What are those you know, mechanisms 
are going on there, what landforms are left behind, then get into what happens when it's deposited, right? Then what landforms do we see in that instance? And that's the general idea. All right? All right, geographers, it's been a pleasure. Have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll talk to you later.